welcome back everyone i hope you've had a a good break we're now going to go into the, the next um couple of um sessions um i'll introduce the the sudep um team next and then and then an open uk uh, update um so as before the, you don't need to do anything you just um be be part of uh be part of the the stream use the uh, q a um functions the chat um functions um and um at the end of, of both sessions there'll be a chance for um questions don't forget at the end of this afternoon there's the um chance to network and join the the uh, virtual network working area which will uh, become live as we get towards the end of the uh, the afternoon um, and thanks for being with us we think there's a, about 460 all tuned in live which is amazing uh, for us so we're so grateful that you're uh, joining us this afternoon and being being part of this it's really uh, uh, appreciated um, so we, I'm going to introduce the next group and we've got five um, in this gang so I, I um, uh, we've got a nice workshop um, for you now uh, with with uh, lots lots of people uh, who are giving their time so I'm going to hand over to uh, Emma and then uh, she'll unleash the uh, the gang um, so over to you Emma Thanks, Colin. So I'm just here to thank everyone for um, the opportunity to do this and just to set the context really. So the experts by experience for the UK Paediatric Epilepsy Programme Board, who are two parents and two young people, have been um, raising SUDEP for a while. And at one of the meetings earlier this year, uh, Vena brought some information to the group and really made sure that everybody knew that this was something that everybody needed to um, know more about and have the opportunity to explore further. Richard kindly made the offer in that meeting that we would be able to get this space at the conference. And it's been brilliant to see all of the different organisations and people come together behind the session, which um, will get started in a second. Benna and Owen, who you've met earlier from the Epilepsy 12 Youth Advocates, who is also interested in SUDEP, uh, will be sharing with you what it means to them personally, but also what is needed in terms of the future of services and care for patients and families across your units. They're really looking to continue these conversations with strategic forums like BPEG and BPNA and NICE and charities and audits and teams and decision makers and everyone going forward to really amplify what's already been started in pockets of good practice ac across the country, but to make sure that we continue to keep children and young people at the centre of everything that we do. So Vena is going to go first and then everybody will just take it from there. Hi. Hi. Firstly, I want, to, I want to thank everyone for the opportunity to speak today. As a parent with a child with epilepsy, I've nearly lost my son three times and each time it has nearly broke me and my partner. No one mentioned it at, at all to us, but we would stay up in shifts until the Daisy Garland funded a nighttime monitor that gave us the ability to get a decent night's sleep and to give us enough of a chance to get medical help when needed or just to settle him down. I want to make everyone aware of the failures that are happening across the board regarding SUDEP. In the Epilepsy 12 report, only 53% of children and young people diagnosed with epilepsy had evidence of information on SUDEP in cohort three. The percentage, however, isn't clear. How many did their own research? How many were told by a specialist? And how many found out the hard way? To further back up these findings, I did an open survey across social media to find out people's experiences due to the amount of posts going up, going up online. It's either not being mentioned, or if it is, it's because families brought it up, ranging from how they were let down because they didn't know enough, sometimes told nothing at all. In some cases, being told at the autopsy of a loved one. There are slides that are a snapshot of just a few testimonials of which I feel I need to share, which will be made available. The key points ranging from a few positives to a lot of, I wish I'd known, so I could have done something to reduce my child's risk, and some that are purely angry and stating that the doctors should be held accountable for not mentioning anything. We would like to start a change in giving families a fighting chance to either reduce risk or have the information or pathways to know that this is an extreme possibility for this to happen to their child. Having a joined up approach with not just the NHS, but external resources and having a clear resource pathway 
for patients and clinicians. Being able to have these difficult conversations is essential in my opinion, even if it's on a, even if it's on a second appointment. Someone mentioning the risks or giving contact information of people that have appropriate resources already in place. In the Eastern England Epilepsy Network, they already have guidelines in place that has that says when it has to be mentioned, when it should and when it shouldn't. Having these in place is good as it shows precedence for its need. Why can't it be the same across the board? Just by starting doing this will probably be alarming to begin with, but ultimately give them the knowledge of risks and help that is available to them. Having this conversation with every patient could also have a positive effect towards mental health, mental health of everyone concerned, whether it's carers, parents, patients, this would, in my opinion, would help either with the anxiety of the diagnosis or survivor's guilt. Knowledge is power after all. If a patient and family are aware of all the sides and impacts of their condition, it can be managed easier. As one testimonial says, awareness and education is the only way forward. And I'll pass it on to Owen. Uh, yes, thank you, Vena. Um, and hello again. Um, obviously, I've already spoken today as a uh, as a youth advocate, FX um, twelve youth advocate. However, um, SUDEP or sudden unexpected death um, in epilepsy is something that I have become very passionate about um, over over time. Like many, I started out not knowing a, a huge amount um, about what this was and gradually understood that it can be quite a scary and uncomfortable topic to talk about, particularly with new patients. When I had my first major seizure around 12 years ago, my parents were thankfully given enough basic information about SUDEP, but the thought of them leaving hospital with a new diagnosis and having been CPR trained must have been pretty daunting. Um, SUDEP can happen at any point, and as Venner has rightly pointed out, people sadly learn about the impact of it far too late or the hard way when there is nothing they can do. But as much as I've already said about the subject being uncomfortable for some, we wouldn't get anywhere unless we actually had these conversations. Um, I know Sammy will be speaking to you a little bit later on from SUDEP Action, um, but I wanted to briefly outline a project I've very recently been involved in, in fact, um, in collaboration with SUDEP Action, looking at at what point SUDEP and more generally risks associated with epilepsy are mentioned in clinics. Um, it has been a conversation analysis research project where a group of us have listened to and analysed in depth at what points in the clinic the consultant may be raising risks. Now, some of these may be quite obvious and dare I say cliched, um, take baths, not showers, don't drink too much alcohol, not too many late nights or additional stress. Many things that my own specialist nurses and my parents still nag me about to this day. But it's at what point SUDEP is mentioned in these clinics or decided to be spoken about. And it was very interesting to observe how much or indeed how little people do know about it. Sometimes it was not mentioned at all, maybe because the consultant didn't want to alarm the patient. Sometimes the patient needed a prompt in order to speak about it. And other times there were perfectly open conversations. But either way, we were able to see there was um, still an element of stigma around the subject. And this is why these conversations should still be happening. So the project had a number of experts by experience in the group as well as specialists, all able to share their views and advice. But I think overall it's, um, it's promising to know there are already guidelines in place, um, but having these conversations earlier will help to improve the care. Thank you very much. And I think it's uh, Lane next. Thanks, Benna and Owen for, um, for sharing your experiences and thoughts about this topic. Um, it's often really difficult to contemplate about how you might have a conversation. I say that as somebody who does this all the time. And I think part of this session is to help people to put in a, a structure for how we do this. Um, and, a, and a structure for making this part of a routine conversation. Um, and I use the word routine advisedly because I think it, it's got to be something that we do all the time. 
Um, so I thought it might be helpful initially to have some facts and figures um, and uh, just sort of take you through that first. And then Rohini and Sami will talk about when and how to have these conversations and how to provide support. Um, so that first slide there is just going through what we're going to cover and then next slide. So just some definition, because perhaps you know, some people know this very well, others don't. So just to say, what does SUDEP mean? It means a sudden, unexpected, witnessed or unwitnessed, non-traumatic and non-drowning death in somebody with epilepsy. And I've highlighted the word unexpected because in some situations, it might not be that unexpected. Um, you might say there's such a high risk that it's something we have in the back of our minds all the time. But actually, at the moment it occurs, it's unexpected. And it doesn't matter whether you think a seizure had occurred or not when the young person was found or a person was found. Um, the important issue is that there isn't um, an obvious cause at that moment in time. So next slide. So I think sometimes it's very helpful to have things at a regional level. Um, and I like to do this, to try and make it a little bit per more personal for our team. And in South East London uh, and our networks, uh, South East Thames, we've got about three and a half million. And based on our number of live births, we expect around about six and a half thousand children with active epilepsy or on treatment. And if we take our risk of, of SUDEP, we look there, we're looking at an overall risk of one in a thousand um, patients each year succumbing to SUDEP. Uh, some of the, the um, data quote is one in 4,500 young people. We did a UK wide study looking at the GP database and established the figure was probably closer to one in 3,000 children. And in fact, there's some good data coming through to suggest that actually the figure for all ages is probably around one in a thousand. Um, I think it's really important just at the outset not to forget other causes of mortality. Um, so they may be a consequence of the condition you've got. And that's actually the biggest factor that we have to counsel families about. And we see deaths from status, deaths from the consequences of treatment. And also importantly, and preventably potentially accidents or suicide. So I just want to highlight in the next slide, just something that is in the public domain. And I know this is not SUDEP, and I've just put this in just to remind us that there are preventable deaths. And for those of you who are not aware of this story, Connor was a young man with a learning disability who drowned in the bath unsupervised with his epilepsy, something that's entirely preventable. Next slide, please. So um, Omar and team looked at um, the data out there on SUDEP in young people, and they collect together the statistics were available. And none of you will be surprised to see that you're, um, you're at an increased risk if you have complicated epilepsy, if your epilepsy began when you were little, if you've got a high seizure burden, if you've got learning disability, and if you're on a large number of medicines. And as a consultant, I can't, I can't always modify that, but I can at least put that into my assessment of risk. Um, and that's really a, an important starting point. If we then move on to the next slide, we'll see in that same study that a big factor coming out, those who had uncontrolled epilepsy. Most people uh, who died of SUDEP had generalized tonic-clonic seizures, GTCS, but 23 times risk if your epilepsy is poorly controlled. Now they then looked at the type of epilepsy and often they were quite big categories, so symptomatic or so-called idiopathic. And they just highlighted some of the epilepsy syndromes where you were at increased risk. And one of those people in me know I'm passionate about is Dravet syndrome. And so if we look at the next slide, you can see, and it's a rather busy slide, but you can see that if you're counseling families of uh, children with Dravet syndrome, you have to have a conversation about the fact that young people with Drave are at high risk of SUDEP. In Charlotte Drave's original series, 20% of the young people in that series didn't reach adulthood. So that's a strikingly high risk. And even now with improvements in treatment, um, the SUDEP risk is there, it's still high. And most studies quote between 10 and 15% 
rate of premature death. And uh, the biggest contributor to that is SUDEP. So it's something about the underlying disorder. And yet we still find families with children with Jave who say that this has not been discussed with them. It's been avoided. But if we look at the next slide, which is back to Omar's study again, you can see that it's not just young people with severe epilepsy. In that overall survey of 108 young people dying of SUDEP, there were five who have or who had what we call Beck's benign, what was used to be called benign epilepsy, now self-limiting epilepsy with central temporal spikes. So the sort of epilepsy that we expect young people to grow out of. And that's a much commoner form of epilepsy. So we can't just avoid these discussions. They're there to be had in young people with complex epilepsy and in young people who we perceive to have yet less complex epilepsy. So if we just move on. This is something that um, working with SUDEF Action, we look at epilepsy risk and what can we do for, to help? And if we have a checklist there, if we think about the factors that might contribute, then that potentially leads us on to what we can do. And when I looked through the slides, I realised that perhaps we'd avoided talking about monitors. And so in my next slide, just have summarised there a list of forms of monitors. And we sometimes say, oh, we shouldn't talk about necessarily talk about monitors or as clinicians we're uncomfortable with it because we say that no monitor can absolutely present, prevent SUDEP and that's true but there are uh, other factors and Van has talked about Daisy Garland supplying monitors and the help for families in terms of being able to sleep at night being able to think through you know how they function as a family so there are all sorts of different monitors there things that you wear on your wrist, things that you wear on your finger or toe, bed monitors, video monitors, all sorts. And for the clinicians out there, um, if you look at the next slide, there's um, a very good paper out there just looking at different sorts of ways of um, monitoring for different seizure types. And this is quite an eye opener to me to make me think about, yes, well, what sort of seizure is it? And why might the effectiveness of different monitors be different in different settings? And as I say, for anybody who's interested, I'd urge you to have a look at that. And then, you know, by thinking about that, we might then move on into research and how that might in the long term lead into reducing risk. And so colleagues of mine at King's are looking at one of the potential clues to SUDEP, and that is that after a convulsive seizure, um, there may be a period where you don't move, where you're immobile. And if you could then capture that period of immobility and produce an alarm for that period of immobility, that could alert a carer that you're not moving after a seizure, and that might allow them to um, go in and, and, and prompt movement and prompt action. So working at ways forward in terms of wearable devices and tech is changing so fast that I think the world of, of monitoring is, is, is changing alongside that. So just a last couple of slides. Questions I think for families and carers and ourselves to ask when we're thinking about all those devices on the market because sometimes families are being um, told about exceptionally expensive monitors to what extent would that device work for my child's sort of seizure, my child's sort of epilepsy? How reliable is it? How intrusive is it going to be? Can I live with that? Am I going to be woken all night by false alarms? And then also, what's the cost? And is there someone out there who might help with that? And that might be Java UK, that might be Daisy Garland, that might be others. And then I think finally, just to hand on and say a big thank you for letting me come and uh, talk about something that's close to my heart as a subject. And I'll hand on to Rahini. Hello there. So um, yes, thank you again um, for allowing me to share a project that we did, which is related to talking about Suda but focusing on two aspects of it, the content of the discussion and the approach for the discussion. We did this as a part of Eco Project. Um, and what we wanted to do through this is not just 
be a box that we take for say epilepsy 12, but also focus on how we can make the content relevant and personal to that child and their family. And secondly, have some um, a, a toolkit available to clinicians in our region to use as a handle to approach this discussion. So as we can see in the next slide, the you know, epilepsy 12, as we've seen earlier in the day, we are probably very slightly getting better with our sort of discussions, but not enough. And there's a lot more we can do. And that's same for our um, region and as it is nationally. And um, keep going. Um, and why this could be, it could be that there may be anxieties about bringing up this topic from clinicians and sometimes helplessness in terms of not knowing what to do. Because what we also felt was there was this anxiety about talking about death, but then what we hopefully will be able to do through um, our as we learn about this more is talk not just about the risk of SUDEP, but also what are the modifiable risks and how can we change that? So it doesn't stay about talking about death, but becomes a discussion about empowerment and feeling more in control rather than helpless and um, scared. And yeah, in the more recent epilepsy 12 as well, we haven't really made much improvement. So this um, being a part of the equip project was helpful because that meant that we could liaise with SUDEP action. Um, as we'll hear from Sammy later on, they, and they provided us with um, some feedback on information. And this in the next slide just has examples of the text that we have put together. And it is quite vast because it includes all the possible scenarios and what it is available for our clinicians to use as a toolkit to pick out pieces that are relevant to that child. So it has all the necessary information. And then as we can see in the next slide, we also picked out how um, we can introduce this consultation. So we spoke to a group of pediatricians and uh, pediatric neurologists in various scenarios. And we felt that how you would approach would differ for different scenarios. And some examples, for example, in the next slide, um, risks are all around us, like driving on a motorway, and we have some control in modifying some of those risks, like wearing a seatbelt. So how is that sort of what can we modify then with regards to SUDAP risk factors? And so just to summarize then um, and move on to Sami, in that through this work, I suppose, what we then felt and got the opportunity to be involved with what Sami and her team were already doing with SUDAP Action is have a more robust evidence-based um, structure to the information that we give to families with the content as well as the approach. So I'll uh, lead you on to Sami now from SUDAP Action. Thank you very much, Rohini, and uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm Sammy from Pseudopaction, and for those of you who might not know um, much about Pseudopaction, we're the only UK charity who are dedicated to raising awareness of SUDEP, epilepsy risks, and tackling epilepsy deaths, and we are specialised in providing support for people who have been bereaved by epilepsy. I want to spend just a few minutes today because we haven't got long before the next session uh, just talking about the project that Suda Action are working on to help support epilepsy risk communication with health professionals and children and young people with epilepsy and their families. There's going to be a lot of information on the next few slides. I don't expect you to be reading it all or to be remembering it all. We'll make them available for you afterwards so that you can have a proper read of them. On this slide here that you can see right now, there are some, some beautiful faces and these are faces of lovely young people who have sadly died because of epilepsy and SUDEP. Um, so whether you know a lot about SUDEP and epilepsy deaths or, or and the risks linked to them or whether you don't and you're quite new to the topic, I just ask that for the next few minutes you keep these lovely little faces in mind um, and use them as motivation to do all you can to help children and young people with epilepsy and their families to live as safely as possible. And also a massive thank you to the families who let me use the photos today. So as Rahini, Rahini has said, um, we want to do all we can to try and improve risk communication for uh, health professionals who support children and young people with epilepsy and their families. In 2015, SUDEP Action and Cornwall Partnership NHS Foundation Trust launched the SUDEP and Seizure Safety Checklist following many years of research into epilepsy mortality and SUDEP risks. 
Uh, this is a free to access tool that helps health professionals who support adults with epilepsy at the moment across clinical uh, settings to discuss, review and put steps in place to reduce any risks that their patients may have. And they try and do this at regular intervals and make sure that it's really patient centred so that the person at the, who's living with epilepsy is actively involved in their own risk management. But because this tool is currently based on adult research, it's only really suitable for young adults who are transitioning into adult services at the moment. And that's not really good enough. We want to make sure that there's something there specifically for paediatric settings and for children and young people and their families to make sure that these risks are being talked about, they're being understood, and that it's all grounded in evidence that's appropriate for this age group. And now we've finally got the funding as a charity to make this happen. And I'm delighted that we're finally working with many of the people you've seen today to make this project happen. So the project has already started, as you can see on this very busy slide. Um, and you can see a rough plan of, of where we're headed today on the slide. The main thing that we really want to make sure that happens though throughout this project and as a result of this project is that we involve children and young people with epilepsy, their parents and health professionals all the way through. We want to also really find out what will work for this checklist. How can we make it useful? How can we make it impactful? How can we make it empowering for people? So there's no point doing it if it's not going to work for the people at the other end. And finally, we want to find out how can we make sure that the checklist reaches the people who need to see it? And that is where you come in. So if you're thinking that you're going to have a, a few minutes just to sit and just listen to me, please think again. Uh, you'll see coming up on the slide now um, another Menti uh, link, which I believe you've used earlier. Hopefully it will work again today like it did this morning. If I could ask you to please either snap with your smartphone the QR code or hopefully go to the link, which I hope will be popped into the chat. Um, what's going to come up on screen will be kind of five questions um, that will really help us with the starts of this checklist project that we're working on. It's going to help us really understand kind of what you already think about when you think about SUDEP and risk, sort of how often are you having those conversations with your patients or the people around you, what might the challenges and barriers be in having this conversation, uh, what would help you in, in being able to have these conversations really well, and how could the checklist help you to do this? How could we make sure that whatever we produce at the end of this project is something that you'd be able to use as part of your team and as part of your existing practice? So hopefully you should be able to work through all these five questions on your own without having me having to click through them. Uh, if the wonders of technology work, I should now be able to share my screen and see if any of the results are coming through for the very first question. We're not going to have long to do all of this, but hopefully it will work if I've got this right. So yes, marvellous. So I can certainly see lots of things coming up on the screen. Hopefully you can too. And I'm really pleased to see lots of lovely colourful words coming in. You can submit more than once, so please do. Likewise, if you want to move on to the other questions, that would be fantastic. But it's really great to see your honest feedback about what comes to mind when you're thinking about this topic, because as we can see, it is important, it is worrying, it is something that can be quite difficult to do that needs to be individualized, but it's super, super important. So we don't have long, I've only got a couple of minutes left. So please keep adding in the questions, adding in your answers to this question. Um, and I'm gonna move back in a minute second to my other slide just to finish off what I'm saying today, but hopefully you should be able to continue answering all five questions, please do. And if you're watching the recording as well, this link is hopefully going to be live for two weeks from today. So until the 5th of October. So even if you're watching this on catch up, you should hopefully be able to add in your thoughts and feed into this project, which will be fantastic. So I'm going to stop sharing this slide now, go back to my slide deck and finish off so that you can then hopefully ask some questions and we can take it from there. So just to finish off, um, really great, big thank you to everyone who's taken part in this session today and to everyone who's listening and, and taking their time out of their busy schedules to come hear this talk about SUDEP. Um, if you have any questions about SUDEP, about epilepsy risks, about what you can do to help produce them, please do reach out to SUDEP Action and you'll be able to see um, our details on this slide here. You'll also see on this slide, if you've already done with your mentee, you might be able to click on this link straight away. And if not, hopefully the URL will be popped into the chat so you can access it later. Um, there'll be, there's a QR code and URL that will give you access to my slide deck today with a few extra goodies in there because we didn't have very long. 
There's also some other resources linked to on that web page that might be useful for you in your practice. And there's also at the bottom of that page, a form. So if you're really interested in finding out more about the Children's Checklist Project, uh, helping us along the way, hearing what's going on or wanting to get your hands on it as soon as it comes out, please go to that form, fill it in, leave your details for me. And I'd love to talk to you further about this project because without your help, it really won't be as good as it could be. And we would love to make sure that you're there to kind of be involved and to help us on this journey. Thank you very much. That's great, thank you. So um, we're gonna move into um, a, a panel type question and answer type. Um, session now thanks so much uh, for, for that it's a, was informative and uh, provocative and very rich um, perspectives from young people's voices evidence base um, things tried in practice and then a, a systematic response from suit of action that's really um, exciting so I'm going to look out in um, Q&A for questions coming through that I'll put to the panel I, I've, I've got one just to start the ball rolling do you think the the, the challenges around SUDEP are trickier for children than adults, do you think it's different, um, or do you think it's you know? Do you, do you have any reflections on 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 this issue compared to what's in place for adults? Well, actually, I think it's just about the same. It's at least with when they're children, you've got that that bit more control and trying to help them when they're adults and living on their own all you're going to do is worry more as to whether they're doing looking after themselves and doing the right things for for themselves thanks Lena. and did anyone else want to come in with that question i think colin one of the interesting things is i do think it's changed over time um so i've been having these conversations for a long time and and i'm really aware now that when i have a conversation with young people with their parents that Actually, I'll quite often start by saying you'll probably have, have you may already heard of some of what I'm going to talk about. And there's, and there's vigorous nodding and the young and quite often the young person will share with you that they've already read about this. And this this is often a first consultation. They've read about this that already on or somebody's mentioned it to them. So I think there's so much more out there um, in social media and the like. And people have, you know, people are in a position where they want to have those conversations. They're reassured to have those conversations rather than it being a surprise. So I think things are changing. Mm. And, and Sammy, is that how it seems to, I mean, it's great that you're doing something that's child focused. Has it felt difficult as an organization to, to, to begin to think of something that's child and young people focused? Or yeah, has it just been so. a natural progression? It's definitely a natural progression. It's, it's very much a new territory for us though, which is why it's fantastic to have the support of so many people in, in the pediatric world to help us along this way. Um, I, I think, like Elaine said, it's definitely something that seems to have shifted in perceptions over the last few years. We see it when we go to conferences, when we're talking to people that actually it's much warmer now. We're ready for it. It's time to really hit home with this project. So, yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to look at the questions for you. Um, so the first question is, I struggle, for example, in in um, in Rolandic so self-limited central temporal spike epilepsy uh, I struggle for example in in that type of epilepsy discussing risks and then not treating how do you uh, approach approach this uh, maybe maybe Rahini do you would you, do you want to take that one <laughs> yeah I think it's as it's about giving the right information to the families isn't it and for some families as long as they know about the SUDEP risk, and it depends on the seizure frequency, all that we can do is give them the right information and answer their questions and then support them through their decisions. So I don't think there is a clear right or wrong answer as long as we've told them what we think they should know. Yeah, it doesn't feel like you think of it any differently or more difficultly in, in epilepsies that we perceive as, um, as less complex. Um, there's a question here about siblings and um, what are your thoughts about discussion in front of siblings? I don't know if that's something anyone's um, thought of um, and that, that might be something that Owen or any you want to come in on. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, well, it's my son's first seizure. The first time I nearly lost him, my oldest was present 
So from the age of seven, we had to explain it then. And that took about a year for him to stop, stop worrying about his brother. And, and he, he struggled with school with it, quite frankly. And there is, a, it does have a major impact on the family. And it's, that is something that will, that does need to be looked at as well when it comes to siblings. You are correct. Yeah, I suspect siblings are often forgotten about in this, which, uh, Owen, did you want to come in with this one? Did you have any thoughts on this one? Bradford, um, I think, I think, yeah, siblings are absolutely a, a big um, key part of everything, not, not just suited, but everything sort of epilepsy based in any, in any part of care, really. It's, um, it's something that does, that does get forgotten about quite often. Um, I mean, it's, I think it's just about how, um, how the discussions are are addressed, um, which kind of goes back to every other, um, you know, the other questions we've had so far about, you know, is, is it a challenge, is it um, trickier for for young people or adults? I think it's how how the how the conversations are um, are given to them in terms of risks and what risks there are, um, you know, if, if you kind of um, poo poo the idea of um, pseudo, should we say, um, then. You know, people just go as if there's not there's, there's not that bigger there's not that bigger deal about it. But um, you know, if you, if you address it with the with the family, including the sibling, um, as it was done in my as it was done in my position, um, my younger sister is um, is great with it. She knows there's a risk. She knows anything can happen. But um, um, she just gets on with it. Um, and it's um, yeah, there's still a, a really key part of the family and a, a really key part of um, of the care that goes on. Thanks. Can I just add add on to that? It's good to, to see that Owen's had a completely reverse situation to, to what I have, and it shows how much of a better impact it can have for the family, knowing the full the full issue of the condition, whereas just finding out firsthand when things go from bad to worse. Thank you. And then, um, Emma, I'm going to let you make the case for why we need the, the voice of young people in, in our looking at solutions of this as a sort of final thing. Um, you, you, you sort of introduced the session. I just wonder whether you've got any reflections on, on, on that. Yeah, just I think just from the RCPCH and us side, it's that it's so important that we have all voices involved. And actually, that's why our programme does work with children and young people who have the specialist experience so in this case that have um, epilepsy but also with their siblings and you heard from one of the siblings that's involved in our project in the epilepsy 12 youth advocate session at the start and with universal children and young people so also those that that don't have any experience or knowledge because actually their peers and their people at school and their people in um, workplaces or colleges or universities that we also need to make sure are really truly part of the whole the whole story so for us you know we really come at it from a rights-based approach the united nations convention on the rights of the child says that you know children and young people need to have a voice in the decisions that affect them and something like this a hundred percent um children and young people and families are are so open and willing and happy to work with us and i think that you know they they truly do bring the solutions just like Bennett and the other experts by experience raising this at the Epilepsy Programme Board and then um, being here today. So, yeah, there's, there's nothing more that can make the case than what we've seen and heard today, really. So, you know, they've they've said it loud and proud themselves and are our shining, shining stars of, um, of this conference and every conference, which is thanks to the way that Epilepsy 12 involves them in a really meaningful way. Thank you, all, all of you. And we, you know, it's because of this sort of voice coming through that we've shifted the um, Epilepsy 12 measures now to oblige um, SUDEP to be one of the required elements of the um, care planning um, content. Um, so previously it wasn't there as, as a measure. Um, so we should be able to um, see what's happening and hopefully with, with you um, provoke more improvement and it sounds like uh, we're gonna have to watch this space to see what um, comes from SUDEP action and so just to remind you to f continue filling in the mentee questions um, uh, around this and it looks like there's other opportunities to get involved along along the way um, here so um so, so join in where you where you can thank you uh, thank you so much uh, all of you for joining